Snap out of it! It's a pinky ring, it's a baby, it's a man's ring. It's temporary! Everything is temporary! Rose! Who's dead? Bring me the big knife. No, Ronnie! Bring me the big knife, I'm gonna cut my throat! Chrissy, bring me the big knife! I tell you, I won't do it! She won't do it. I lost my hand! I lost my bride! Johnny has his hand! Johnny has his bride! You want me to take my heartbreak, put it away, and forget? Who's that guy? You're engaged. And you're married. You're my daughter. I won't have you act like a putan. And you're my father. All right. You got a love bite on your neck. He's coming back this morning. What's the matter with you? Your life's going down the toilet. In time, you will see that this is the best thing. In time, you'll drop dead, and I'll come to your funeral in a red dress. What? The rom-com genre has undergone a metamorphosis in just the past few years. Looking to the past, you have periods of high points in the genre's history, whether that be the innocent films of the 30s, the screwball comedies of the 50s, or its commercial high points of the 80s and the 2000s. You have these periods of success for a proven genre that gets everyone into the theaters. However, it feels like this genre is going away, or at the very least, has morphed into something else. Your typical rom-com usually follows a structure. Two people have their lives going on, they intersect, wacky shenanigans ensue, they get feelings for each other, relationship gets deeper, then something happens that pulls them apart, something happens again to bring them together, and then they get back together. Credits, boom, simple. Of course, there have been variations with the structure. The focus is on just one person and the other is essentially a catalyst for the story. Gender roles get changed and flipped around. The romance is inside of a different movie, but still carries rom-com elements. The latter of which is the most significant, in the sense that the modern rom-coms are both so intrinsic to modern American filmmaking, but are also so banal or lame that they have lost their foothold in the market. Take any of the MCU movies, for instance. The majority of them, particularly the movies that are solo movies like Captain America, Thor, etc., all have a love interest. Sure, that love is not a definite part of the story sometimes, and the story is more dictated by the hero versus villain dynamic. However, that growing relationship moves along as the hero welcomes the love interest into their world more and more. You have funny lines, funny bits. This is especially evident in the Thor series, where Thor becomes more comedic and his relationship with Jane becomes more distinct and layered. Essentially, the action comedies took over for the romantic comedies as comic book movies became more popular and took that light comedic tone and monopolized that in the American market. In addition to all this, it's also very evident that international audiences have more of a desire to watch action comedies than romantic comedies. The box office relays this fact as the past 10 years or so show. In addition, the rom-coms that do succeed seem to only succeed in America. Even a movie like Crazy Rich Asians, which would be perceived to have a ton of appeal in Asia, did not do well in China and South Korea in particular. This is all to say that we have hopes for a rom-com renaissance, but it may be tough given the current state of the genre. That aside, the 80s were a complete contrast. The 80s are seen as kind of a golden era of movies, but it is definitely true for the rom-com genre. In the entire decade of the 80s, you had an average of just under one rom-com appearing in the top 10 of box office returns for the year, with films like Tootsie going as far as number two for the year of 1982. This may not seem like much, but given that from 2013 to now, you had a grand total of zero rom-coms making the top 10 of any decade, I would say that that's significant. With such a loaded field of movies from Coming to America to Splash to less big movies like Pretty in Pink, it's tough to account for every film when speaking historically. When Harry Met Sally gets the correct amount of praise for what it did for the genre and as a movie itself. However, you can only talk about the same five or so movies over and over again before you think that there's gotta be more. Enter Moonstruck. 
Moonstruck is a rom-com from 1987 that was incredibly praised and beloved at the time, but it seemed to slip out of the public consciousness. Well, we're here to reintroduce it. To give a full breakdown, however, it would be incorrect to not talk about how wrong it could have been initially. The name of the script was initially Women in Love, which just sounds like the most generic ass movie you could think of. Then it was Moonglow until finally getting to Moonstruck. With out of the way, let's meet the people, starting with Cher. Cher was an established and credible actress at this point, co-starring in films like Silkwood and Mask. With The Witches of Eastwick coming out the same year as Moonstruck, Cher was still searching for an Oscar to add to her impressive resume. Plus, she had never really carried a movie all by herself. In Moonstruck, she is front and center on everything. The poster, the cast, essentially it's her and Nicolas Cage. While Cher was probably at her most relevant, Cage was just getting started. This was the perfect time for him to really break out as a true film star. Nicolas Cage was starting to build a great career, after having smaller parts in films like Rumblefish, while also starring in a hit in Valley Girl. 1987 would be a landmark year for Cage, as Raising Arizona would come out the same year as Moonstruck. With our two leads set, the supporting cast rounded out nicely. Olympia Dukakis played Rose in what ended up being a standout role for her. Vincent Gardenia played Rose's husband, Cosmo, a role which got him nominated for Best Supporting Actor. Boy, they really had some awesome performances in this one, huh? Then you also had longtime that guy, Danny Aiello, play Johnny Camareri. I could keep going with the cast, but let's get to the creative team behind Moonstruck. Writer John Patrick Shanley was known as a playwright up until this point. His plays were mainly off-Broadway and didn't really blow up until Moonstruck. Now he's even directed movies like Joe vs. the Volcano and Doubt. It's always fun to see two absolute polar opposites in someone's filmography. Lastly, there's director Norman Jewison. Norman was the real mastermind behind this classic, having directed 25 years worth of feature films in his career. While there were outliers like Rollerball in his career, he had an eye for dramas like In the Heat of the Night and Jesus Christ Superstar. Hell, he even did an adaptation of Fiddler on the Roof. All this lent itself to a movie that feels like the best play imaginable. That's probably because of the stellar performances in Moonstruck. With such a loaded cast, you would think that would be tough to stand out in the crowd. However, because of the free-flowing nature of Moonstruck, you get a lot of varied performances. It's the Cher show, but she's not fantastical. It's a grounded performance that has highlights. The line delivery is really where she shines. But that's all balanced by her more logical approach when juxtaposed with the backdrop of super fantastical characters. Take Johnny Camareri for example. On the surface, he's just some guy visiting his dying mother in Italy while trying to get married in New York. But watching Denny Aiello's take on the character is really something. He's up there with the best Hollywood schmucks of all time. He brings this level of comical sadness and embodies this supreme level of putz. It's a real bright spot of comedy for the movie. Then you have Rose, played by Dukakis, who is the heart of this film. She plays it so well and is able to generate such sympathy by just a few key line deliveries here and there, as well as some great face acting. That's another thing to point out with the performances. While they can escalate and get too wild sometimes, we'll get to Nick Cage in a second, they are also incredibly human. Maybe as a Cuban, I can relate to Italians in movies, particularly with the family dynamics and the mannerisms being similar. I just find it all incredibly sympathetic and can get very attached to everyone in the film, especially when they have these memorable and quotable lines in almost every scene. Now we've come to Nick Cage. Nick Nicolas Cage is lauded as being one of the most unique actors in the postmodern era. Whether it is with his film selection or his acting style, he has been praised and criticized by many a filmgoer. Breaking down Nick Cage in the film world deserves its own video. However, it's interesting to note that this is probably one of the more subdued Cage performances. While he definitely throws out some zingers and gets wild sometimes, I lost my hand! I lost my bride! Johnny has his hand! Johnny has his bride! You want me to take my heartbreak, put it away and forget? 
he still remains human and real. He's this vessel for the wolf that Loretta talks about, and he's able to tap into this animal nature from time to time. It really shows range when you're able to do this performance and pull off a real comedic performance in Raising Arizona. Just saying. As much as we've praised Moonstruck, there is a tiny flaw here. The filmmaking leads a bit much to be desired. Sure, they'll throw in the occasional low angle and mix it up here and there, but it doesn't have that pizzazz to make it a true dynamite 10 out of 10. It's shot kind of like a play. They do provide, however, a fantastic production design. You really feel engulfed in this world, from the wardrobes to the locations. The whole thing makes you feel like you're watching a documentary about these people. It's not nice and neat and compact, much like the story. The one bit of fancy filmmaking that they do utilize is their usage of the moon. The moon and how people react to the moon become a theme throughout the film, as the moon becomes intertwined with love and desire and these tangled emotions that are felt throughout the film. With the moon and the moonlight, you're able to put yourself in the film and feel what the characters are feeling, similar to how the production design and filmmaking in Do the Right Thing created this atmosphere of heat that Spike Lee wanted the audience to feel. With that feeling and that deep understanding of the characters, you get let into the humanist nature of Moonstruct. There's all this romance and intrigue with what's gonna happen to these people and all these iconic lines that keep you entertained, sure. However, there is a real sense that the film cares about its characters. Take the Kapamaji couple, with Rita played by Julie Bovasso and Raymond played by Louis Gus. Sure, Raymond may not be the brightest bulb and Rita seems kind of simple or passive, but the film takes the time to show them at work and how they interact with each other. Then, they take it a step further by showing this sweet and intimate moment they have while still utilizing the moon in the scene. Off the top of my head, I can't really think of any other movie that shows older people and their relationships in such a loving and sympathetic way. A lesser film would have made these characters so over the top and try really hard to make them super funny. But credit to Jewison and Shanley for crafting this wonderful world that warms your heart while also making you laugh. It's always nice when you see the occasional Moonstruck clip getting shared online, especially through something like Criterion Collection, but we can't give enough praise to this film. It's wild and mannered, it's so fantastically paced, both of how people talk and how the film is edited. It is also this incredibly humanist film that doesn't shame people and their decisions, but still manages to provide a sense of morality in this wild narrative. Moonstruck functions as a tragedy, a farce, a great date night movie, and above all else, a rom-com. A true and great rom-com that deserves praise for its wonderful characters, fantastic pacing, and a great climax that will put the biggest smile on your face. Truly a classic. And that'll do it! Thank you very much for watching, we hope we did this movie justice. Much like our other video on Exorcist 3, Moonstruck is a big movie for us at 305 Film Studios, and we wanted to sing its praises. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to like and subscribe for more videos like this. Comment below any ideas you have for a video we can do in the future. We highly recommend checking out our video on Exorcist 3 after watching this one. The link will be at the end of the video. Thank you very much for watching and have a great day.